If you follow Brazil's defense story closely, you have probably noticed a recurring pattern. The country's most consequential milestones rarely look dramatic at first glance. They often arrive as procurement line items, integration notes, or first batch contracts that outsiders dismiss as too small to matter. The Brazilian Navy's decision to sign for an initial batch of 16 MANSUP anti-ship missiles is exactly that kind of moment. It is not simply a purchase of ammunition. It is a policy signal that a long-running development effort is crossing the threshold into real operational capability, with downstream effects on fleet lethality, coastal defense options, and most importantly, Brazil's ability to sustain maritime deterrence with sovereign industrial capacity. For years, Mansoup was easy to file away as promising, still in testing. That framing is now outdated. Once a Navy commits budget to an initial buy, the program's center of gravity shifts. The question is no longer whether the missile can be made to work in controlled trials. It becomes whether it can be produced, integrated, trained on, maintained, and replenished at scale and on schedule. A first contract creates what defense economists call a credibility bridge. It forces the ecosystem to move from prototypes and demonstrations toward supply chains, quality gates, and operational doctrine. 16 missiles is not a war stockpile, but it is the kind of number that can validate production, enable shipboard integration packages, and justify the next procurement step without pretending the risks are already zero. Technically, the baseline MANSUP is designed to deliver credible maritime lethality in the literal and near-sea environment that matters most to Brazil's day-to-day -day sovereignty mission. Public reporting describes a range of about 70 kilometers and a top speed around 1,000 kilometers per hour, paired with inertial navigation and an active radar seeker for terminal guidance with a sea-skimming profile intended to complicate shipboard defenses. These specifications are not about chasing record-breaking distance. They are about creating a reliable, repeatable capability that can be fielded across Brazilian platforms and sustained by Brazilian industry. In other words, the baseline variant is optimized for the first order problem, make the Navy's anti-ship weapon supply predictable, supportable, and scalable under Brazil's control. That logic becomes clearer when you place MANSUP into the platform roadmap. Brazil is not building missile capability in isolation. It is pairing it with a fleet modernization plan anchored by the Tamandere class frigates. Public information describes a loadout of eight MANSUP missiles per ship, and the first of class has been associated with sea acceptance trials in mid-2025 with commissioning targeted in 2026. On paper, that pairing matters because it turns missile development into fleet lethality. The value of a domestically produced anti-ship missile rises sharply when it is linked to a modern combat system and a shipbuilding pipeline that can keep the integration standard consistent over time. It also gives the Navy a clean template for training, logistics, and tactics. MANSOP's relevance does not stop with new frigates. One of the most strategically efficient features of the program is the ability to refresh combat power on legacy hulls, effectively extending their deterrent utility while newer ships arrive. Reporting has explicitly framed MANSUP as a replacement for Exocet MM40 Block de Sioux on platforms including Niteroi-class, Green Helge-class, 
and the Barroso Corvette. This matters for two reasons. First, it raises the Navy's aggregate missile capacity faster than waiting for a full new build fleet. Second, it reduces dependency risk. When a country relies on imported missiles, it is not only buying a weapon, it is buying an ongoing relationship with external licensing, export controls, upgrade decisions, and wartime replenishment uncertainty. A domestic program cannot erase every dependency, but it gives the Navy far more leverage over continuity of supply and life cycle decisions. The real capability argument becomes strongest when you look at testing and readiness gates. According to recent reporting, the program had reached seven launches, with three more planned in the second half of 2025 as part of the certification pathway and the transition towards serial production. This is exactly the type of detail serious audiences look for because it reveals whether the program is still in the realm of promotional claims or moving through measurable milestones. A missile program that can point to an accumulated test series and a defined remaining launch plan is not guaranteeing success, but it is demonstrating a controlled path toward operational clearance. Combined with the first procurement batch, those indicators show that Brazil is managing risk in the way mature defense ecosystems do. Test enough to learn, procure enough to industrialize, then expand once the integration and sustainment cycle proves stable. At the industrial level, Mansoap is also a narrative about Brazil's defense enterprise maturing beyond platform assembly into systems level competence. The missile is associated with SIAT as a key industrial actor, and the broader program has been tied to international collaboration dynamics, including publicized agreements involving EDGE, aimed at advancing development and completing program goals within defined timelines. This dimension matters because sovereign capability is not simply a label. It is the ability to manage design authority production learning curves, spares, and upgrades. A country that can build a missile and integrate it across ship classes has created a transferable competence, one that can be applied to future seekers, data links, propulsion refinements, or coastal defense architectures. This is where the Mansup ER storyline becomes strategically useful so long as it is treated with discipline Public descriptions of an extended range variant cite a range above 200 kilometers, a 150 kilogram warhead, and a guidance package combining inertial navigation with satellite assisted updates and an active radar seeker with a turbojet architecture. If realized, that would change Brazil's maritime engagement geometry, especially when paired with modern sensors, airborne surveillance, and the kind of queuing networks that are increasingly central to naval combat. But the more important point for a Brazilian audience is not the headline range. It is the continuity of an upgrade path anchored in domestic industrial participation and intellectual property arrangements that support long-term sustainment and evolution. That is how you avoid the trap of buying a one-and-done capability that becomes obsolete on someone else's schedule. One of the most underrated aspects of MANSUP, and a perfect example of Brazilian pragmatism, is the coastal defense angle. Reporting notes that Brazil's Marines adapted the launch system of Astros 2 to fire MANSUP without requiring modifications to the missile itself. That is an unusually efficient pathway to layered sea denial. It suggests a doctrine where surface combatants provide mobile maritime strike, while shore-based units add an additional axis of threat that complicates an adversary's planning. 
In strategic terms, that layered approach is a deterrence multiplier. It forces any hostile actor to assume that maritime approaches are covered not only by ships at sea, but also by land-based batteries capable of contesting choke points and coastal operating areas. All of this aligns with Brazil's central maritime reality, the country's strategic lifelines, resources, and economic security are deeply tied to the sea. Public Brazilian defense narratives often frame the Blue Amazon Maritime Area in the millions of square kilometers, and recent official-facing communications have used a figure around 5.7 million square kilometers in describing the scale of the stewardship challenge. In that context, deterrence is not about matching any great power ship for ship. It is about creating credible, sustainable risk for any actor who might threaten sovereignty, energy infrastructure, or maritime trade. Mansup, when linked to Tamandare-class modernization and legacy ship refresh, becomes a cost-effective way to raise that risk without betting the entire strategy on a handful of exquisite platforms. There are, of course, friction points that serious analysts should acknowledge. 16 missiles is a starting point, not an end state. Meaningful wartime resilience requires larger inventories, robust reload pipelines, and a mature maintenance ecosystem. Baseline range around 70 kilometers is sufficient for some mission sets, but it does not automatically solve wider area sea control problems without sensors and doctrine to match. And as with any modernization effort, platform timelines and integration maturity will determine how quickly capability translates from paper into fleet readiness. None of these caveats undermine the program's significance. They simply define the management tasks Brazil must execute to turn a moment into a durable advantage. The strategic payoff is straightforward. With the first batch contract, the test schedule moving through defined gates, integration pathways across new and legacy ships, and a credible coastal defense extension, Brazil is assembling the building blocks of a sovereign maritime strike enterprise. If Brazil sustains procurement momentum and industrial learning through the late 2020s, the early 2030s can look meaningfully different. A navy with modern frigates carrying a domestic anti-ship weapon. Older ships revitalized rather than sidelined. And a layered deterrence posture that better matches the scale of Brazil's maritime responsibilities. If this kind of defense industrial deep dive is valuable to you, follow the channel. Because the real story is not one missile, but the industrial ecosystem Brazil is building around it.